In this week's episode of Lewis on the Law, I've got another great show for you. We're going to get into the probate process with attorney J.B. Hilliard. So hold on to your wills and your estate plans, and we're going to dig it up. Welcome to Lewis on the Law. You are listening to Lewis on the Law. My name is James Lewis, and I am here each week and every week to empower you, the listener. That's right, empower you with information, legal information. And this week, I've got an awesome subject because this topic touches each and every single one of you guys. You may not know it yet. You may not even believe it, but your lives will be touched by the probate process because everyone is touched by, well, you know, not to be morbid, but death. So I have, I'm glad to have attorney J.B. Hilliard on with me from the law offices of J.B. Hilliard LLC. And we are going to dig into the probate process. That's right. There's no pun intended there because, <laughs> you know, some people prefer cremation. That's so, correct. Yeah. So uh, J.B., uh, why don't you start off? Just tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, first of all, James, thank you so much for having me on your program. I've been looking forward to this. Um, and hello to everyone that's listening and who's looking. Um, but my firm uh, specializes in estate planning, which includes will drafting um, and the probate process. And we also do uh, legal consulting for just uh, general legal questions that people have and also legal coaching for some of those people out there who are do-it-yourselfers. Uh, I, I help coach them through the, the probate process, especially with filling in the forms and things like that. Well, that is excellent. So let's let's start this off right in the beginning. What are we talking about when we talk about the probate process? Okay, so the the word probate is is technically to prove a will. So that the probate process is simply the legal process used to prove that a will exists out there for someone, or to admit the process of administering an estate through the courts. Um, so there may be cases where there is no will. So that's the administration part. But in either way. Uh, is the process, the legal process going through the probate court specifically is not superior court or the magistrate court of the counties. The probate courts of Georgia have been specifically set up to handle this type of uh, these types of matters. OK, um, so so when you so is the probate court, I mean, let's 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 dumb this down now. So the probate court is literally physically located at the same place the rest of the courthouses usually are. Is that correct? Usually. Usually. Yes. Sometimes it's separate? Sometimes, as far as uh, my experience has been in some of the southern counties, sometimes it's set aside or set apart maybe a couple of blocks <laughs> they, away. They don't, but want, they don't want those guys <laughs> next to I don't, us. <laughs> I don't understand what, what that reasoning is or justification. Like, oh, but, my God, those guys talk about death. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want that here. But usually it's in the same general government complex as the other courthouses. Um, so, you know, it just depends on the county. Okay. Uh, so, um, so each county is different than I guess is what you're saying. Could be. Yes. Could be yes. different. Yeah. I yes. guess some are the same. Although we have what's called the Georgia, we have Georgia rules that apply across the state, but there are still some subtle differences in maybe, well, for one in fees and filing fees. So you always have to check with the court on how much it costs to file a certain document or what we call petition. Um, and then there may be what's called local forms where we have standard Georgia forms for a lot of the processes involved, but there may be certain specific forms to that court in that county um, that you always want to ask about ahead of time to make sure that you're filing the right documents. Okay, so what is the legal process of administering an estate? What 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 is how does this whole thing start? Well, that's a great question. Um, it it starts with someone filing what's called a petition, and that's just the form that that who, goes to it the starts court. with someone like who? who like like, uh, like like who? Like Sam over here? <laughs> hey, Sam. Um, it, it normally wouldn't be just a random person. It would okay. normally be someone, that person that's identified specifically in the will or the person that's deceased, which we call the decedent. Um, or it could be the the next heir or the next of kin that's filing if there's no will. Okay. And then they file a petition with the court to start the process. So that identifies the person who's who's passed away um, and you also have to include a copy of the death certificate to prove that this person has passed away. And then it also identifies either the person who's filing the petition, the petitioner, as that personal, what we call the personal representative or that or their um, 
nominating or assigning or requesting that someone else serve as that personal representative. So that could be, um, it's all inclusive of all the terms of the, the, the point of contact for the court. So that could be the executor, if there is a will, an administrator, as far as the technical terminology, an administrator, if there isn't a will, or a guardian, if there's a minor involved, or a, a, an incapacitated adult, or a trustee. So all of those titles, all of those head honcho roles are considered the personal representative. So the probate process starts off with the identification of that personal representative so the court knows who to communicate with and who's in, basically in charge of handling the business of that person who passed away. Okay, so how does this personal representative know which pro okay cuz cuz you said every county the, the locations are different. How does a person know which county to file in? Well, that's another great question. Um you you go by the 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 decedent's uh domicile or place of residence, county of residence, um where he he or she resided when um he or she passed away. And um in some cases there may be an out of state decedent. So someone living, let's say, in Florida, but if that person has property in Georgia, that property has to be probated in the county wherever the property is located. So there are two kind of prongs there, either where they lived when they died or where they have property if they're not a Georgia resident. Now, now I'm asking you that question because because early on in my legal career, my dad died and mm -hmm. he, and I had to, I, you know, he didn't have a will. Mm -hmm. I had to actually probate his estate and he and and I filed as executor in, in the county where all his property was. Mm -hmm. And of course, the judge who is actually a cousin of mine. Oh, was, wow. Yeah, it was like, yeah, yeah, James, you need to like read the law. <laughs> and yeah, he made fun of me, called me up, made fun of me and Aww. told me I had to probate in the county my dad died in. So, Well, yeah. just for the audience's purposes, the judges won't make fun of you um, unless they're related to you, like in your case. Judges are pretty compassionate when it comes to these types of cases, especially with people doing it without attorneys or doing it on their own and not really knowing what the first or second or third step is. So. Yeah, it's really bad when you're an attorney <clears throat> and the judge knows you're an attorney and, and you get it wrong. Well, but that's not your practice area, so they yeah. should give you a break on that. Yeah, there's, there's, I never get any breaks for some reason. <laughs> well, you're related to the wrong people then. You shouldn't, <laughs> shouldn't go in those courts. Some of those people have high expectations. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, so uh, what's the next? Okay, so we've identified the person and the county. Uh, and uh, so what are the next steps in this process here? So then you have to just make sure you file the correct form. And there are a couple different forms to file. Um, so let's talk about if there is a will. So that's considered testate, a testate case. And if there is a will, then you can file a petition to probate the will in what's called common form or what's called probate the will in solemn form. Okay, okay, that that is really good because every now and then I do get questions on my website and sometimes, and I'm going to have to apologize to some of my listeners out there because I, I give this announcement where I say, if you send me your your questions, I'll bring an attorney on air and then two or three months later and I never, ever, ever address the <laughs> subject. It's because I actually book a month in advance and mm -hmm. sometimes a month and a half to two months in advance. So, um, so sometimes if you send me your question, be patient with me. I'll try and get to it. But you've had some great topics on, on your show. I've been kind of catching up on some previous shows, and you, you are doing a great job out here. So, oh, again, I'm really just thankful that you invited me here. I appreciate that. Oh, okay. Yeah, no problem. Glad to have you. It, and just for you listeners, eventually you can go to my website, jameslewislegal.com, and every single legal issue you can possibly think of will be archived there. That's a noble that's goal. Awesome. <laughs> yes, that's very awesome, though. And so you're helping us in this because this is a process that's, that, that's, that a lot of people are going to go through. People who don't even understand they're going to go through this process. Right. A lot of us are going to go through this process. They're going to be like, what in the world am I going to do? What do I do? You right, know? right. I mean, and people will be named ex administrators administrators, people will have to file as executors, you know, and, uh, and, right. they, and it's a lot to deal with. You're, you're dealing with the grief of the, the lost loved one in the first place. And then if you get this kind of added to your plate there, there is a lot to, to think about and consider. Um, and a lot of people don't know where to start, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And, and the conversations don't happen before the death, unfortunately. No, they, they so, rarely do. So that person isn't prepped, you know, yeah. Kind of getting in the right mindset to to know this is coming. Yeah. Unfortunately, that that happens. 
Exactly. So this was a question I actually got uh, a couple of months ago, unfortunately. I never ad- got to address till you came on. But okay. so explain a little bit about the difference between common form and solemn form. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, common form, um, and, and I haven't had any clients. You, you know what? Uh-oh. We're going to have ahead. to actually get into that in our next oh. segment. I know these segments <laughs> go really, really fast. So, JB, give them some contact information for you. Oh, absolutely. Um, my website is jblaw.biz. That's J-B-L-A-W dot B-I-Z. My phone number is 404-980-3135. And you can reach me via email at jb at jblaw.biz. You're listening to Lewis on the Law. My name is James Lewis, and on today's show, we are getting into the probate process. I got a lot more for you guys. You can always reach me at jameslewislegal.com. You can check out any of my archive shows. When we get back, we're going to talk with JB, and we're going to get into the distinction between common form and solemn form. You're listening to Lewis on the Law. You are listening to Lewis on the Law. My name is James Lewis, and that is some early music of Danny Elfman, who is a soundtrack artist nowadays, and he's done the soundtrack for about a million movies that you don't even know his name to. But he actually played in a band in the 80s, and they were not very popular, but he's managed to land contracts after it, so... And the, the 80s was a great time. The 80s was, that was a great, a yeah. great time for uh, yeah. those of you who are a little more mature <laughs> out there in the audience. I'm I can remember. More, I'm a little more mature, but I didn't remember them that well. So, oh. yeah. But the 80s were a great time. So we were talking about uh, the forms that, that uh, I guess, the, the forms that a will can be probated in? Yes. Okay. So there are two types of petitions where we left off. The petition to file a will in common form and in solemn form. So common form simply means that when you file the petition, you don't have to uh, give notice to any of the heirs. So because there's no will, it, it's just um, Georgia recognizes the heirs, so the spouse, the children on down, all the, the next of kin, basically. But for all the other petitions, note, just about all the other petitions, notice, notice is required whenever you're filing something on behalf of that estate or, or on behalf of that person that passed away. This particular form does not require that, which is a, could be a good thing. I don't know. But the other side of that is it stays open. Basically, it's not binding. Nothing is really happening to be binding on all of those interested parties until four years after that petition is filed. So it it stay, it kind of hangs out there for four years. Oh, wow. So that's common form, right? That's the common form. Okay. We probably want to stay away from that, okay. if at all possible. Because we don't need a, a, an estate or a probate case to stay open for that long if it's not necessary. Um, so you have the option of filing in a solemn form, which is it does require notice to all of the heirs. Um, but basically, the personal representative is identified. Uh, all the heirs are notified of the petition being filed and that person um, being named. And then um, the court approves and goes about the business then of assigning the administration of the estate to that personal representative. Um, So typically, um, there might be some heirs that might want to, um, might not want that person as the personal representative, and then they can file a, they can file with the court to challenge it if they wanted to. But again, they're getting notice immediately. So they have to sign off on that person in the first place. So, um, and if there's any challenge, then that goes through the court. So the court then knows who all the interested parties are and knows, um, who, okay. who's doing what. So there's a little bit of an advantage to that, right? Yeah. And, and, and it's a quicker process depending and every estate case is different, of course, but depending on, um, just in, in speaking general, generally, the process is much quicker in solemn form versus the the common form petition. Okay, that makes sense. I want to wheel back a little bit into the executor, administrator, the person. Let's talk a little, because, I mean, we can't underestimate the importance of of that position. Let's talk a little bit about uh, about who that person is. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because there is just so much responsibility on the shoulders of that personal representative. So whether you're calling yourself the executor or the administrator, 
Um, basically, you have... Now, wait a minute. Is there a difference between the executor and the administrator? The <clears throat> difference is just in the title. The role is the same. Um, administrator is just called administrator if there's no will. And it's called executor if there is a will. Okay. But collectively, everybody is a personal representative if you have either of those titles. You're a personal representative. Okay. As the court just kind of balls it all up into one title to make it easier and um, more straightforward, hopefully more straightforward. Um, but the PR, what we call the PR, that person has what's called a fiduciary duty to manage that estate. So when the court says the word fiduciary, you know that's like the top level responsibility um, on your shoulders. So that means you're just operating in the best interest of that estate. You're taking care of and managing well, let me back up a step. I get kind of excited. I know it's kind of morbid to say you're excited about talking about death, but um, well, I get excited you're, you're about excited this. You're excited talking about your area of the <laughs> law. This is, can... this is how I help mm-hmm. people, so I get excited. Um, but uh, to back up a step, the personal representative first has to marshal in or make sure to protect all of the assets. So kind of gather, take an inventory of everything of that decedent um, because unfortunately, a lot of people, as soon as someone passes away, they like pillage the the home. Like, yeah, they, they just go, go they start going to the house and start stuff. selling stuff. And it's, and it's crazy. It's yard some of the, sale central. Yes, <laughs> it's crazy. Some of the stories I hear from some of these clients, it, it amazes me because um, unfortunately, I just went through um, my mom's death and I'm her personal representative. Um, but my family, well, first of all, they know not to mess with me. But. Um, <laughs> Fortunately, it's just my brother and, and myself as, as her children. And so, and we've always had a great relationship. So there was no issue there. But some of these families, you really have to have a strong person. And this goes back to the uh, estate planning segment you had earlier. When you're writing your will, you want to make sure you put a person in there who's not going to be afraid to deal with the family and, and is going to be able to deal with those family dynamics. Um, so I digressed a little bit, but I wanted to make no, no, that, that kind of known. That, that's because it, extremely it get, important. It's extremely yeah, important. It can get really ugly. I mean, when, I d- I've dealt with that in my family. I mean, I've had to like, uh, you know, go toe to toe with people. In oh, the, yeah. yeah it's, so. it's sad, but it happens um, a lot more than we care to think. Um, but that person, that PR, that personal representative needs to kind of protect all the assets until uh, the court deems otherwise. So while... While now, when you, when you say a fiduciary duty, what are you really talking about there? I'm just talking about that person can can ultimately be held liable for some in some cases for assets going missing or assets being damaged or anything anything related think, to that. I think estate. that's pretty important to throw out there yeah. is that the executor I mean, or the administrator, the PR, has can be held liable for for people pillaging through granddad's be. house or yes. mom's house. Right, right. So you want to just make sure that everything is secure. If that person lived by him or herself, you want to make sure the house is secure, the personal belongings are secure, um, and and take then ultimately you're taking inventory of everything. Um, you're going to be reporting back to the court on all of the, I say assets for lack of a better term, but all of the property that that person held um, to determine first how it's going to be distributed. And we could talk about that a little later as far as the distribution order. Um, But you also want to make sure you're continuing to pay any current debts. Um, If there's property that requires insurance like the home or the belongings within the home you want to make sure to maintain the insurance on it Um, and things like just um, making sure any other administrative expenses are being paid so while you're filing those court petitions that's an expense of administration so because the court is going to charge you to file every piece of paper that you file (laughs) the court charges you Uh, for everything charges you for that so as part of the administration expenses, that's part of the estate. Um, you may have to come out of pocket initially to pay for it until you get all the accounts and everything kind of situated in the estate's name, which we'll talk about later. But um, in the meantime, you're just trying to get a handle on everything that belonged to that decedent before anybody else gets a hand on it. Okay, that makes sense. That's that's really good. I think that really, really kind of got into it. So are there any other duties that the personal representative has? Yes, so the um, personal representative will be reporting to the court, back and forth with the court. So uh, after 
you go through the process of getting what's called letters um, of administration, which is basically when you file that initial petition, you get that back um, saying the court has approved you to be the PR. And then you can go continue going about the business of doing what needs to be done for that estate, contacting creditors, contacting other family members, um, just dealing with the, the everyday business as if that person were alive, but now you're just dealing with it in the name of the estate. Um, and then um, usually those letters are required for um, like setting up a separate bank account uh, or some other things that uh, maybe creditor agencies or other organizations need to prove that you are acting on behalf of the estate. Okay. So uh, when we get back, we're going to talk a little bit about what to do if, if uh, a, a personal representative isn't fulfilling his duties. Mm. But, you know, first I want to go ahead and give throw out a, legal, a little legal disclaimer here. Lewis on the Law, at Lewis on the Law, we bring you legal information. My name is James Lewis. I'm your host each and every single week. And this show is not designed to replace the advice of an attorney. If you have a serious legal issue, you need to go ahead and contract with an attorney. You can always contact me on my website. I know a ton of attorneys. If I can't help you with your issue, I can always direct you towards an attorney who can help you with your issue. A lot of the attorneys come on this show. We cover almost every single topic you can possibly think of. I come each and every single week to empower you, the listener. Now, I have attorney J.B. Hilliard on with me. We're talking about the probate process. J.B., will you give them a little contact information for yourself? I will be happy to. Uh, my website is jblaw.biz. That's B-I-Z. My email is simply jb at jblaw.biz. And my phone number is 404-980-3135. You're listening to Lewis on the Law. My name is James Lewis. You can get in touch with me each and every single week at jameslewislegal.com. You can email me at james at jameslewislegal, or you can give me a call at 404-610-0075. When we get back, we're going to talk to... We're going to talk a little bit about what to do if a PR, personal representative, isn't doing what he has to do to secure the estate. Mm. And we're going to talk a little bit about the notice requirements. You're listening to Lewis on the Law. You are listening to Lewis on the Law. My name is James Lewis, and I am here each week as your host of Lewis on the Law to empower you, the listener, with legal information. Once again, this information is not designed to replace the advice of an attorney. If you have a serious legal problem, you need to go ahead and contract with an attorney. You can always contact me at my website, jameslewislegal.com. If you have a question you'd like answered on this show, and, and I've had some debates on how to handle this, so I think I just need to throw this out because, because if you have a question, sometimes it takes me a while to get to your topic because – I book in advance, but don't but don't let that stop you. Go ahead and email me or, or drop me a line on my contact page with your question that you'd like covered, the topic that you'd like covered, and I'll try and find an attorney who actually knows something about the topic and that I can bring in to talk about the issue. Now, I am really fortunate to have attorney J.B. Hilliard from the Hilliard, from the J.B. Hilliard, uh, wait a minute, from the law offices of J.B. Hilliard. Let me get this right Thank because you. it's really <laughs> important. And uh, we're talking about the probate process. And J.B., why don't you give them some contact information uh, once again? Oh, gladly. Um, my website is jblaw.biz, B-I-Z. Uh, my email is jb at jblaw.biz, and my phone number is 404-980-3135. Excellent. So when we left, we were talking about what to do if the, if the personal representative is not doing his duties. And I wish that would never be a question, but there's always someone out there doing dirt. To, to put it, that's a non-legal term, I know, but uh, <laughs> folks just yeah, don't yeah. want to do right. Is that a term right. of art, doing dirt? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's, it, I mean, we laugh about it here, but it's really sad that families have to go through this. But um, if you find in your family that the person who's been assigned as the personal representative is not doing the job that you think he or she should be doing, you can challenge that. Now, there's a caveat to that challenge. You must be a person or entity of interest. So what that means is either you're an heir 
you know, the in the next of kin line, uh, or you're a beneficiary. If, it, if there's a will, you're a beneficiary under the will, or if you're a creditor. Uh, if the decedent died owing you money, then you have an interest in that estate. So if, if any of those three or all three apply to you, then you can challenge that person um, and notify the court that the person is not acting in the best interest of the estate. Okay. Um, so what what does that challenge look like? What do you do? How do you challenge that person? Well, first you can um, contact the court and just request an accounting and an, or an inventory. So an inventory is, I kind of alluded to this earlier, an inventory is where the, the personal representative takes, uh, uh, basically tallies up or accounts for documents, all the property, um, and the estimated value of all the property of that decedent, that person who passed away. Um, and so that uh, accounting should be reported back to the uh, court within a certain time frame. And if the heirs or the interested parties, uh, interested person doesn't receive that, they can request, initially they can request that as a way to get that PR on his duty to to do what he's supposed to do and then report back to the court. That's the first thing they can do. If that doesn't get them anywhere, then they can actually petition to have that person removed as personal representative. And then the court can either ask for another personal representative to step in or they can assign what's called a county administrator, which is is in the court system. Um, and I don't really know how these folks are selected, but I know that, of course, they're operating by the court. So they're, they're, they're coming in unbiased and, and in an objective manner to do the business that needs to be done for that estate until such time as someone else is, is assigned. Okay, that's, that's pretty good. Those are a couple of really good steps. Now, let's go back. Uh, well, I think maybe we ought to change this up a little bit, and let's talk about the proper order of the estate distribution because that's, that's really what we're talking about here when we're talking about whether the, whether the PR is doing his job or not. Right, and some people think that he's not when he really is, and because they don't understand that order, that's why, mm-hmm. where some questions may come up. But I'm, I'm glad you asked that. So first um, is the year support for a spouse or if there are minor children. And what that is is the, the surviving spouse can request a year support, which means she or he can get up to 12 months of resources from the estate, whether that's keeping the house, whether that's um, income that's coming into the estate or funds that are already in that decedent's accounts can liquidate some of that to live on for, t- for up to 12 months um, to, to maintain the same or similar standard of living. is not to kind of be high on the hog at this point. Oh, my hubby died. Now I get all his money. No, it's just to maintain the same standard of living um, for that spouse. And again, if there are minor children for, for that family to, to continue on for that next year after that decedent's death. That's the first thing. That comes before any bills are paid, any creditors or anything like that. Then there are the funeral expenses, of course, need to be paid. Typically, what I like to tell my clients is to include maybe uh, as part of the estate planning, get a, um, a life insurance policy, maybe a small one to cover that. So that doesn't come out of existing funds of the estate, but that's, that's totally optional. But that's um, an, on an individual preference level. Um, and then there are state administration expenses, like I talked about earlier, the, the expenses of filing petitions, the expenses of hiring uh, an estate attorney to help you through the process. Um, if you're hiring people uh, to provide professional services like a, a tax accountant to do the estate taxes, because you'll, you'll eventually have to do, deal with the taxes um, for the estate and for the decedent. Uh, so if you're paying somebody to do that, that's part of the administration expense. Uh, so that comes next. And then we have just reasonable expenses of the decedent's last illness. So if they went from being sick to then passing away, unfortunately, that if there are outstanding doctor bills or anything related to that last illness, that's next on the list to be paid uh, if there's anything outstanding there. And then, of course, taxes come before anybody gets anything. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, that's, state... that, that's our second favorite subject. We're on death oh, and now taxes. Yeah, death and taxes. So I, I'm actually surprised it's not higher on the list, but <laughs> um, it does come before any beneficiaries get anything. Um, and that that's state and federal taxes. Um, and then if there's any kind of judgments or liens outstanding that were um, 
that the decedent was subject to before passing away or any secured loans, that those get paid next. Okay. Then all oh. other debts. Yeah, okay. yeah, there's more. There's still there's a okay. long list of people to be paid. Then all the other creditors out there. So whether that's credit card debt or whatever other consumer debt the decedent might have had, that comes that's last on that initial list that we just went through. Then all the beneficiaries can get their distributions. So in paying or taking care of those earlier items in that priority listing, if assets or property needs to be sold or, um, well, yeah, sold to get those proceeds in order to pay off some of that in, in that line of, of priority, then that's what the PR needs to do. And sometimes the, the beneficiaries under the will or the, the heirs under the estate think they're getting something, but they can't. They're just, that's, they're at the bottom of the list, unfortunately. Oh, wow. That's a terrible place to be, the bottom yes. of the list. Yes. Okay. Now we kind of grazed over this. Let's go back into some of the notice requirements, like the timing of notices. Okay. Um, part of the duties of the PR, um, once he's appointed or he or she is appointed, then you have 60 days to notify all the creditors of that person's estate. So Typically, when you initially file the petition, you're also filing notice with whatever the county's legal organ is, legal newspaper, newspaper is. That's usually done at the same time. So that notice is, is done at that time. You don't necessarily have to wait two months. But there are, of course, there are creditors that don't check those, those county newspapers. Um, so as you're Part of your responsibility as the PR is to also check the mail of that decedent. And as mail is coming in, then you know what the cre- who, who the creditors are. And you need to, you know, send them a letter or send them some notification that this person has passed away and then find out what they need as far as next steps to close that account. Okay, excellent, excellent. So let's move on here a little bit. So have we kind of touched on at least the first steps of the probate process? Yes, and very briefly there, you can divide the probate process into three distinct phases. The first phase is what we've been talking about, just filing the initial petition to open the estate and determine the PR. And then the biggest piece or the long, the longest piece is the administration of the estate and then closing the estate. Oh, okay. So we've kind of touched a little bit on some of the things that go on in the administration piece, but that can go that can be several months long or several years long. Just depends on the estate. Yeah, <laughs> several years long. That sounds about right. Wow, <laughs> time is just flying, it really is. flying by. I wanted to get into the big question of what if there is no will, but we're gonna have to do that when we get back. Okay, JB, it's great having you here. Why don't you give them some contact information for you, real quickly? Okay, my website www.jblaw.biz, not .com, .biz. And my email is jb at jblaw.biz and phone number 404-980-3135. You're listening to Lewis on the Law. I am here each and every single week to empower you, the listener. You can always contact me at jameslewislegal.com. Give me a call at 404-610-0075. When we get back, we're going to kind of go back through the process because there's a lot to digest here. And then we're going to talk about what to do if there is no will. You are listening to Lewis on the Law. My name is James Lewis, and I am your host this week and every week on Lewis on the Law. And we are here to bring you legal information, not legal advice. This show is not designed to replace the advice of an attorney. If you have a serious legal issue, you need to go ahead and contract with an attorney. You can always contact me at my website, jameslewislegal.com, or give me a call at 404-610. You can email me at James at jameslewislegal.com. I am honored to have attorney J.B. Hilliard in the office with me. Yeah, uh uh-huh. And we are talking about the probate process. Now, J.B., why don't you give them some contact information for you once again real quickly? Okie dokie. Thank you, James. Um, My website is jblaw.biz, B-I-Z. My phone number is 404-980-3135. Or you can email me at jb at jblaw.biz. And yes, it's just jb. 
Excellent. Excellent. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we, this, this show, this show had a lot of information in it and it's an important process. So I just want to kind of see if we can wrap up in a nutshell where we've been before we moved on to, before we move on to what to do without a will. Okay. Um, we started off just kind of explaining the probate process in general, and that's when you basically notify or let everybody know that a person has passed away, and that starts the legal process of taking care of that estate and, and assigning someone where the, the court has a point of contact of communication back and forth with one, one person, one individual who's assigned as the personal representative of that estate. And then we kind of talked about... Uh, what happens when there is a will? There are two particular types of petitions you can file with the probate court, and every county has a probate court. Oh, I forgot that part. Um, every county has its own probate court, and you file a, either a petition to file a will in common form, which is that four-year process, which you may not necessarily need, or file a will in uh, solemn form, which requires notification to all the heirs. Um, and the probate court you go to is determined by the, the decedents, the person who passed away, their place of domicile or where they resided when they passed away. It's very important. You can yes. even be an attorney and still make this you mistake. you got to go to the right court. Or um, if that person was living outside of the state of Georgia, but they have property, real property or land or a home in Georgia, then it's the county where that property is located. And then we got a little bit into what to do when that, that personal representative is, has a lot of responsibility, responsibilities on his or her shoulder. So what, to hap- what happens if that person doesn't act in the best interest of the estate? And we talked about what you could do as far as challenging that. But the key point there is to be a person of interest of the estate. Either you're an heir, a beneficiary, or a creditor. If you're just an outside, another family member kind of down the line in the next of kin line or you're just a good friend of the family, you may not have an opportunity to challenge because you, the court doesn't consider you a person of interest. Okay, very good. That was great. Now let's get into what to do if there is no will because this happens a lot. Oh, yes, more than I care to even think about. Even in my own situation I'm dealing with. I mean, me and we my were, wife don't have wills. Yeah, and, so and you I need to know, see, you need know to see me. I know, you, I y'all need know to better. make an appointment with me very soon. <laughs> uh, make that something to do on your calendar before the end of the year. <laughs> um, but if there is no will, then you file for um, letters of administration. So, again, that person, that personal representative can file an, as a, another petition form um, to um, administer the estate that has no will. And once that form is basically assigned off or approved by the court, then you're issued letters of administration, and which is just a document saying you took the oath that you're going to act on behalf of the estate in the best interest of the estate. And then you can present that document to banks or creditors or whatever other entity needs it or requests it in order to get access to the decedent's accounts or other things that belong to the estate. Sometimes those organizations won't release information until they get those letters, which is really just a one-page document, but it's called the Letters of Administration. Okay, now, were you saying there's a point where there's no administration necessary? There's a form that you can sign that says there's no administration necessary? Yes, and that is a somewhat quicker process overall, but there are Um, A couple requirements for that, and that's get another form. The court has a lot of forms for us to to submit. Um, But if there's no administration necessary, that means um, that there, of course, there is no will and there are no debts of the decedent. The very important thing. The very important. There are no debts. And the other important thing that could get tricky with certain families is that all the heirs are in agreement as to how to divide the property. Now, if they're, and they all have to sign off on everything. So if they're, you know, it's easy if there's just two people, typically, like two adult children and a parent passed away, and they're the next of kin. They're no other, there's no spouse or anything. But when you're dealing with four or five or six people in that same lineage, then it can, it can get a little tricky. But you all have to agree, and you all have to sign off on an affidavit saying you agree as to the disposition or the division of the, all the property then you can, you can do a no administration necessary petition. Okay. Um, so are there any other types of petitions here that we need to talk about? 
Um, there is the the so the first one I talked about is a permanent administration, but there is a, a petition for a temporary administration, and that's typically used when um, either no personal representative has been assigned yet, um, or there's just some delay of some sort going on where um, either a petition is in the process or there is a will, but it's being contested. So if there's something else going on, maybe the court deems it necessary to assign a person temporarily until all those outside issues are resolved and then a permanent person can be put in place or or assigned. Okay, so let's go ahead and close up this process a little bit. I want to get to the closing here. I mean, we're, you know, getting towards the end of the show and I don't want to leave Already. people <laughs> hanging. Yeah. Okay. Well, closing the estate um, is, again, an, another petition, unfortunately. And <laughs> Lots you have to, of petitions. You have to pay to file all of these petitions. But Ouch. The, the probate court considers the, the estate closed when all, all the debts have been paid, all the taxes, all the tax returns have been filed, and then any taxes do have been paid. Uh, all the property has been distributed to all the beneficiaries, whatever is left. There are no other outstanding claims or anything. Um, and the personal representative has to file um, an annual accounting every year within uh, 60 days of the anniversary date of when that personal representative was was um, assigned, uh, when the court uh, granted him authority. And uh, so every year you're doing that. And so with the closing of the estate, you're uh, you're submitting that last accounting, that last inventory. So the accounting is everything that's come in and everything that's been paid out, to put it simply. So you're reporting to that, reporting to the court with all of that. So once the court is satisfied that everything has been done above board the way it's supposed to be, everything has been reported properly, nothing else should be coming in, then they'll they'll close the estate. They'll discharge that person as the personal representative. So that PR should not be liable for anything else after he's officially discharged. Um, so he can rest assured that, you know, his job is done. <clears throat> Excuse me. Even if something else comes in, which at this time shouldn't be the case, but it, there's always something that could happen afterwards. But that's that's the the quick and dirty of it. OK. OK. So uh, so are, is there anything else here that we have to talk about? Um, I, I just want to throw <laughs> out a couple things for for those um, in your audience who are do it yourselfers. I understand that, you know, paying an attorney all these magnanimous fees. Now, we don't get char we don't charge a lot, but um, some attorney's fees can get outrageous. So I understand you want to do it yourself, but a couple of quick tips. Just make sure you're following the instructions on all the forms. Make sure that one thing that people don't think about, print on one side of the paper. Like I know a lot of times when I'm at home, I always do double-sided printing to save on paper, but when you're submitting a petition to the court, it sounds very simple. But a lot of people don't think about this print on one side of the paper. Wow, that's a really good tip. Um, it's, it's just, you know, is because otherwise you're wasting a trip and then you're going to have to go back and resubmit it or try to submit it. And then the other quick tip is if any petition requires initials, even if you're typing in all of the other information, if there is an initials line, you have to write your initials just like you're signing. When you sign on the signature line, you have to write that out. You can't computerize that. Um, of the courts won't very, accept that. Very important thing just, to know. I just saw that recently with a client that said she tried to do it herself and the court rejected her mm -hmm. petition. And I, I need, and immediately saw that that was one reason why they probably rejected it um, because the initials Now, when the courts in. reject it, do they give you, do they tell you why they reject it or it's just Some rejection? Some do. It just depends on the uh, on the court clerk that you're dealing with or the county that you're dealing with. In this case, this particular client wasn't told what was wrong? She was just told it was wrong and needed to get an attorney, which I'm glad they told her that because she came to me. But, yeah, they, they might tell you and they might not. They're not allowed to give you specific legal advice. So that might be crossing the line a little bit into specific advice. I don't I don't yeah, know. Yeah, Every court right. does a little they, bit they differently. Have, they have to be careful about walking that yes. line. So, JB, we are already at the end of our uh, show. I can't believe yeah, how fast it, that went. I told you it would go really, <laughs> really fast. So why don't you once again give them some contact information for you? I would be so happy to. Um, again, my website is jblaw.biz. That's B-I-Z. Um, you can email me at jb at jblaw.biz or the phone number, if you prefer to call, is 404 980 
888-789-3135. My name is James Lewis. I'm your host this week and every week here at Lewis on the Law. I've got another great show for you guys next week. I'm going to have attorney Richard Percy come into the studio, and we're going to talk about intellectual property. Ooh. So, yeah, I know, right? I like Exciting, that. huh? <laughs> so until next week, guys, take it easy. 